Hey guys, welcome back. Today on the podcast, I have Jessica Espendieri. She is the podcast host of Open Late. She also leads retreats and sound bowl meditations and events. And she has a mentorship program called Awaken Your Inner Healer. And Jessica lives in LA with her husband and her partner, Lauren. And I'm so excited to have you on the podcast today. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me, Jennifer. I'm really excited. Oh my God. Thank you for reaching out to me. I was like, someone wants to be on my podcast. This is really exciting. I love it when people hop in. So today we have a really juicy conversation. So what we're going to talk about, we have a topic today and it's how half the world practices non-monogamy and many don't realize it. So we've had a little bit of like pregame conversation before this podcast. This is going to be really exciting and juicy. So Jessica, take it from here. Why don't you tell people a little bit more about you other than that very quick intro that I just did and then help launch us into this topic. Yeah. Okay. So thank you uh, for that really sweet introduction. I think a good place to start with me is that I had no intention of being in an open relationship. I had no intention of being polyamorous, marrying a man, but having like a, a very intimate, deep relationship for the last three years with a woman. Um, I grew up, you know, Catholic, monogamous. I didn't really know there was another option. And um, I was a serial monogamist, you know, relationship after relationship, three to four years here, three to four years mm -hmm. there. And when I met my husband, I was in a place where I was like, I want to do something different. Like I want to kind of live outside the box. But for me, that didn't lend into sexuality at all. That was still kind of a repressed area of my life. And, but we were so adventurous together and we ended up having an accidental threesome. Ooh. And I say accidental because it was not premeditated. We never talked about it. Um, we ended up just like going home with a, a girlfriend of mine and this was very early on in our relationship. We were not married yet. We had been dating for maybe a year, a year and a half. Uh, but we knew we were very committed to each other. We were monogamous. Like we never talked about anything. But that opened Pandora's box and we never put the lid back on. We just kind of took things in stride and year after year just tried different new exciting things with each other. Um, and with other people slowly, you know, and just like getting the ground underneath of us every time we would try something new and see if we liked it. And about five years in of being open and being really comfortable in that space, we met Lauren, who uh, at first she and my husband had a very like connected sexual chemistry, but also a lot of vulnerability between the two of them. And they had a beautiful friendship that turned uh, very sexy. And I got to witness it, but also be a part of it from the very beginning. And so the three of us had this beautiful relationship, um, kind of leaning into like what a triad maybe is, or some people call it a thruple, which is when all three people are sort of dating together um, and falling in love. And then that sort of started to morph like as we grew as people and um, the two of them more or less became like best friends or well they've been and they're you know very close like family um but way less of a sexual relationship and she and i also continue to carry on our intimacy and we also then built a business together so we have this very cool family um dynamic but also she and i you know are still like very loving and so we have different relationships like sometimes we have our friendship and sometimes we have our business relationship and sometimes we have our you know romantic relationship mm -hmm. and my husband's incredible holds space for all of it loves it uh and has really grown into this like i think community lifestyle almost yeah. um even if it's just the three of us at this point but we are open and um both polyamorous at this point in our lives. And if you would have told me eight years ago that this is how I'd be living, I'd be like, you're crazy. That's completely not even in the scope of my reality. And people who do that are just like sexual deviants. I'm like, I couldn't even handle it. <laughs> that Catholic girl inside now, you is like, uh-uh. Yeah. Now I'm like, if you tried to tell me that I had to be monogamous for the rest of my, monogamous for the rest of my life, I would really struggle. Yeah. Um, I would. Uh, 
Okay. So much juiciness that I want to dig in for what you just said. So the first part is you fell into being open. So that's hilarious. Mm-hmm. I don't know that I've ever met anyone else that didn't have some sort of like premeditated, I really am not happy in my relationship. So I'd like to open it kind of like adventure into being open. In fact, I just recorded a podcast yesterday with my friends where we were teaching people like blocking and tackling of just trying to convince your partner to be open. And the two of you were like, whoa, we just had a threesome. I'm so curious. (laughs) The conversation the next morning, maybe after she left, were you like, damn, that was fun. We should do that again. Or what happened? Well, it's really interesting because there was an element of that for me but it was overshadowed by all of this fear and shame and guilt. Um, And I got really anxious the next day. And the thing is, my husband and I were both in this place where we were doing a lot of personal development work. Um, He was even a coach in, in that like space. And we were like in the habit of like, okay, well, what, what's my emotion? And let me name it. What does it feel like in my body? Um, and he was able to like help me like relax those anxieties and really understand that it was a lot of excitement. And then the other emotions, you know, that we would maybe call like negative emotions, which I don't think any are, but like the lower vibrational ones like fear and shame were coming from a place of like, what are people going to think? So it was nothing about like what, was coming from me it was all of this internalized um you know misogyny and and sort of patriarchy and things that i had grown up with religion and so i was able to separate them and say wow okay i could let that hold me back and he was also like we don't have to do it again and i was like but it was so fun (laughs) can we i want to (laughs) that was it i was like wow i'm i i think i'm pretty bisexual he was the first person i ever told and I had been attracted to women for my whole life and never really did anything about it. I never acted on it. In fact, I ran out of a couple potential threesomes or potential like bisexual experiences in college because I was like, this is getting a little too scary. Yeah. <laughs> and I would just yeah. like, yeah. I literally would walk out of a bedroom, like gotta go have work in the morning or something that was so lame. One of my girlfriends, who um, we've been friends for a long time. And it, actually she was like in one of those experiences. We still laugh about it till this day. Cause she's like, it was like with a guy friend of ours. And she's like, you just got up and left. And now you're Miss Polly Emery. <laughs> you're like, I've grown so, up, it's okay. <laughs> yeah, so there was definitely an element of like anxiety and oh, what are people gonna think? And, and he was like, people don't have to think anything. No one has to know. And he really encouraged me. He's like, if you want to explore this with other women on your own, please do. Also, if you want to keep exploring it together, that'd be great. Um, and so we just, yeah, we kind of navigated that way. Wow. So two things I'd like to add to that or to maybe to just add a couple things. Yeah, I'm just going to say it. The first thing is I'm so glad that you had community and that you were already doing the work, like both of you were in it and you had the language and you had built having conversation, hard conversations together so that this just mm-hmm. became another thing to process, right? Absolutely. Mm-hmm. We yeah, had the like, framework already. Absolutely. You had the framework. And for the first time in my life, I'm in a relationship where we can do that. We had even this morning, some difficult conversations. Um, we are not married and living together. And my kids, I'm just recently divorced from my second husband earlier this year. And so my kids are feeling a little bit of instability with that. You know, they were asking me some questions last night, like, are y'all going to get married? You know, what does this mean? And then like, is he going to stay and hard stuff that this morning I came to him and he, uh, he went out and met up with some friends last night. And so I didn't get to talk to him about it before we went to sleep. And so when I woke, woke up, we got our coffee and the the first thing we did was process the hard things. Like, I don't know what to say to them. And so Mm. we talked about it and I said, well, I'm going to go get my nails done. Just did. And he said, I'll take him to breakfast and I'll talk to him about it. So, I mean, like having that kind of level of intimacy and incredible communication in your relationship takes this kind of stuff to the next level where you can easily go, okay, I feel safe. I'm safe in my body. I'm safe in my relationship. You're not going to leave me just because we had a threesome Mm. last night. (laughs) 
<laughs> Thank yes. you. And I, I love you sharing that because I think that the relationships, everyone's like, oh, it comes down to communication to have a healthy relationship. And communication is so scary, but it creates safety. And that's what people I think miss is like, they're like, oh, it's so scary. I don't want to do it because because it's scary, it feels like it's actually going to create instability or uncertainty. But no matter what the information is, if it's really hard to hear, if it's like, you know, mediocre, makes you sad, if it's if it's great news, all of those things just create more safety because you have more information. Even if you don't like the information, yeah, it's, you know. it regulates your nervous system to know where you stand, what mm-hmm. someone else's intention is. And so, I mean, obviously I'm a big fan of communication um, because ultimately I, I really believe it just creates safety no matter Absolutely. what. Absolutely. Well, and I love your yeah. husband's Unless response lying. to you. <laughs> yeah, because to me, the, the, the other big thing that I'm learning these days is my, I don't have ownership over my partner and they mm. don't have ownership over me, right? Like we are two completely unique individuals. And I love that he said to you like, hey, babe, if – you know, go for it. If you want to go explore this on your own, or if you want to explore it with me, with other people, like you have my blessing, go for it, you know, go do it, go do the things. And I think that especially for men in our culture, that's a tough thing to say. Like what's coming up sometimes even for us, as we're talking about cracking the door open to our currently monogamous relationship is, am I enough? Like, you know, he's saying, am I not enough for you? is all the things I'm doing, like, are they not enough? Is there's this not enoughness feeling, right? Which maybe mm-hmm. came up for you the next morning. Like, oh shit, I'm scared. Is he going to go run off with this girl? Like, is he now going to think we're total? like so many feelings? So many feelings. Um, interestingly enough, because pe- people will ask that all the time. Did you feel like, oh, he might like, like her better than you? Your relationship was like so new. I never had that. I think I just knew he's my person and from when we decided to <clears throat> be together it was very clear like I've never had a doubt that we were going to spend our lives together and but over the years the not enoughness has come up even in like wanting to spend more time with someone else outside of me and it took me being in this style of relationship, being in an open relationship, practicing different levels of non-monogamy to really understand that never can one person satisfy all your needs. It's it's just, it's frankly impossible. And that's like also a very unpopular opinion um, when you have, you know, a society that paints a picture of like soulmates and the one and Amen. did a whole episode on the danger of the one. <laughs> Um, and I think that there's like a, a right person, right? There's like a really great person for you. Maybe there are soulmates, but even your soulmate will like, will just die on the rock of trying to like please your every need. And it's impossible. Like we have different ways that we express and different things that we love. And it's it creates so much pressure when two people try to get all their needs met from each other, especially in long-term relationships. Of course, in the first two years, it's like so easy. You know, you have all the chemicals and the pheromones and um, it's new. It's the honeymoon phase. But once that tends to wear off, you're like, I'm like, who goes to the theater with me? <laughs> like, that's what I really love. And Pasha doesn't really enjoy. Although the older he gets, the more he enjoys, you know, like artsy things with me. But, you know, I can't engage him in financial conversations and when he meets like a really smart woman and like that's what they like to talk about is crypto, I'm like, oh, babe, it's awesome. And she's hot, like, please. Because I'm out. Go for it. <laughs> have, yeah. And it's, it's nice. It takes, once we can sort of realize, I think once you take away the trying to do it because it's, it's frankly impossible, I think that actually helps with a lot of the feelings of insecurity of am I not enough? Um, mm. That feels so good. Yeah. I always say it's unfair to expect our partner to fulfill every single need that we have. And I loved your examples of like, he wants to talk crypto and I am just not into it. And so he finds, you know, a hot chick to go talk about crypto with, go for it. Yeah. (laughs) Please have fun. Yeah. Yeah. So this might actually lead us a little more into that conversation of like, how does half the world practice 
non-monogamy and not really know about it. Let's talk about I feel like this yeah. might be like an unfavorable opinion and it might get some For people sure. feeling some things, which is always fun. So let's do it. Yeah, we're going to activate some nervous systems here. <laughs> um, Everybody just I, breathe. <laughs> so, you know, the statistics on um, – polyamory non-monogamy right are on the rise so you have more people curious it's like the search engine for non-monogamy is just on fire like the, the google stats so you have a rise of people who are already practicing you know whether it's um monogamish relationships non-monogamy open um swinging like the lifestyle polyamory which polyamory is like i think the full range where um you know you can be in love with multiple people at once and so that's already coming up and all of those different sort of relationship dynamics kind of all fall under this umbrella of you know consensual or ethical non-monogamy which also there's a lot of people in the space who are like why do we need to call it you know ethical are we saying that non-monogamy is inherently an unethical practice so there's just like there's so much i think language jargon that people want to really label things but that's kind of the general consensus is these types of relationships are communicated about they're agreed upon there's usually like boundaries um, or agreements uh, i like those two things i don't really like rules but people have all different ways to set up their relationship to create safety and to create a container to be with other people and there's probably about i don't know 10, 20% of the world that's practicing some form of this in some way. And then you have maybe more because who's reporting it? I was in the closet for a full five years before anyone knew about our relationship and our tendencies. It wasn't until Lauren came along that we actually came out about it because it was like, what are we hiding? This is like the most beautiful part of our life. Um, and then you have the statistic that upwards of 50% of people have engaged in cheating or infidelity in their relationships, in their marriages or their relationships at some point in their life. And that is like a staggering statistic. So I'm always like, this marriage model feels a bit broken. Like if my car broke down 50% of the time I drove it, I would probably consider riding a bike, <laughs> something a bit right, more reliable. Right. Um, but I think that when we start to realize that infidelity is just another form of non-monogamy. Maybe we can call that like non-consensual non-monogamy or unethical, whatever you want. But it really is non-monogamy because non-monogamy is essentially just when you can have multiple relationships, may they be romantic or intimate or sexual or loving somewhere on the spectrum at once. They could be the bilateral of like, I'm dating him and I'm dating him and they are you know, heterosexual so they're not dating. Um, or it can be sort of what Pasha, Lauren, and I had where it's like the three of us are all interested in one another and we're all dating in this little pod. So there's, there's many ways to practice. Those are just two examples. And when you cheat, you're also just having two relationships. It's just that usually one person doesn't know about it. Maybe they both don't know about it. And... I'm not here to talk about like what type of person someone that's unfaithful is. I don't think that cheaters are bad people. You can never sort of label or group, right, someone's intention. Um, however, they're just people who haven't yet learned to communicate. Maybe they don't have the safety to, right? You see a lot of women in, a, in abusive relationships, right? They can't leave or um, people who have like fallen out of love but have children and really love their partner as a partner as a roommate like they think this is a good thing and so it's like a don't ask don't tell because mm -hmm. um, why would we want to break up a beautiful family there's just so many dynamics i mean and then there's like you know you're fucking cheaters <laughs> we're just like <laughs> narcissists and you know so we can't say like it's one type of person but what we can say is it is a form of non-monogamy hmm. um hmm. So I think that, you know, likely more than half the world is practicing non-monogamy. And the more we can get comfortable with that and accept non-monogamy for what it is, I think the more you'll heal the infidelity 
And it can turn into an open conversation because we take away the taboo of like open or polyamory or swinging and we start to normalize it. And then people can maybe feel safe to say, I love you so deeply, Mm -hmm. um, but sexually I'm unfulfilled or emotionally I'm feeling disconnected. You know, I want a certain level of intimacy or newness, you know, like there's nothing like newness energy, right? Yeah. So yeah, I feel like I've been talking forever. Do you have questions? No, I do. I have so many things going on in my head and it's so interesting. You and I don't know each other. Like this is the Mm -hmm. first time we've ever seen each other and it's hilarious. And we live, like I'm in Arkansas above Texas, if you're not sure and you're listening internationally where that is. And she's in California on the other side of the continent. But the collective is, I think, feeling the same. I mean, I had literally this almost exact same conversation yesterday with my therapist at 8 a.m. in the morning. Mm. And then on the podcast that I recorded yesterday, I was like, this is nuts. And you're right. It's like it's like this collective expansion of consciousness where we're realizing it, it makes me think of the book Sex at Dawn. Like, y'all, this has been going on for since the beginning of time. Like, let's just call it what it is. And let's have a mature, yeah. conscious conversation about it instead of you cheating. So many men reached out to me when I first opened up my relationship and I got on Tinder and I was very honest about who I was and what I was looking for and that I was mm-hmm. an open, you know, monogamous, married woman. And what I was, you know, what I wanted, I had so many guys that would DM me and say, you know what, I'm, I'm married. At least they were honest. I'm married and she doesn't know, like I'm married, but I can't leave her for whatever reason, like financially she'll ruin me or like she'll kill me or whatever. Right. Right. And they would say these things and it was amazing that they were being honest about it. Right. But what if we could have a conscious conversation with our partners that is like, you're right, you know? in my, in my, uh, in my therapist conversation yesterday, she was like, Jen, she's a, a poly focused therapist. And so she's mm. like, I have so many people in my practice, clients of mine that are have an asexual partner. There's just, they're just not interested in having sex with them anymore. Um, or for whatever reason. And so she said, you know, my job is to help them open up their relationship so that the person that is interested can go and find a partner or multiple partners that can fulfill them. And it's like, so it's happening. The global consciousness is rising. And I love that we're having these conversations. Same. Also, I, so many people will like come to me asking for recommendations of therapists. And so, and I always have had them. But having this podcast now for nine months, all my therapists are completely booked. So if you're just taking new clients, please give me the recommendation. And unfortunately, it's based on the state that they're accredited to, right? So mine Mm -hmm. is only in Arkansas because I have so many people that I've wanted to give her number to as well. And she's like, Jen, stop. (laughs) They can only be in Arkansas. So if you're listening to me and you're also in Arkansas, I'm happy to refer you to her. So one question I have for you is... um, I'm in a group, uh, in a program and a lady came in last night and asked a question and she said, you know, I haven't told my part or I hadn't told my partner that I'm in this group and it's a very sex positive group. Um, yes, there's swingers. Yes. There's people that are poly. Yes. There's people that are just trying to feel into their sexuality and figure out what they Mm -hmm. like. And she said, I hadn't told him that I'm in this group, but I finally had the guts to last night. And he just went off the handle, was like, what are you doing being in this group with swingers and people that are talking about their sex lives? And so we're talking about, obviously, people that are in relationships with other sort of conscious humans that can have conversations. What do you do when you're in a relationship and your partner just refuses to have the conversation, to allow you to open up, like that kind of blocked off individual archetype. It is such an interesting dance. Um, And it's, I love this question. I also like when this question comes up, it's, it's hard to answer because it's so different for everybody, right? We can't speak to each specific relationship dynamic. Um, But I think there's a level of using you know as much vulnerability as possible if the, if you're the one who's going to like really open up and say this is something i'm interested in um you know making sure that as you communicate it's not like you're projecting because it's really like your wants and your needs so not projecting that like the other person hasn't provided them because ultimately 
you got to this place by maybe not understanding what your needs were and definitely not being like forthcoming about them. So many of us will for years suppress um, a desire or an attraction and we never tell our partner. So like we're responsible, right? We came to this party together. And so I always tell people, um, keep it about, you know, what your experience is and be really vulnerable and honest and then have patience. Like those, those three things, not like making it all about yourself, but definitely saying like, I'm going to own this. I've had these thoughts and these feelings and I didn't share them. Um, and that's on me. Maybe I, I didn't have the courage to do it before. Um, but I want you to know, and this is like almost a script, but I always tell people, let your partner know, look, I, we're in this relationship and I, I want to be with you until, you know, till death do us part, right? Like I'm still married and I want to be with Pasha forever. Um, and what I'd like to do is for you to know all of me. And I've been kind of keeping this part of myself hidden. I know this is a lot of information. And so I'm totally willing to have patience with you as we navigate this, but I want to do this together because I want to be with you. And so to reiterate and to create that safety of like, I'm committed to this relationship, but let's also find a way to um, for me to be fulfilled sexually. And that's just if that's what you want, you know, if, if opening up is because you'd like to sustain your primary partnership. It's obviously different for people who are like solo open or solo poly who aren't coupled up and are dating multiple people it tends to be easier than opening up a, a 20 year marriage. And so I think that's like what your question was more about. And then, you know, you asked, well, what do you do when they're just unwilling to hear it, won't have the conversation? I think you set a time frame. Like if it were me and it were my husband who was like, I'm not entertaining this at all, I would say, okay, like internally, I can give him three months and I can try to maybe poke at this again and, and lay some like breadcrumbs out. Um, give, giving somebody enough time to like really process because right, this is rejection for them. This is abandonment issues popping up. This is all of their fears and anxieties um, coming to the table. And then, but setting those checkpoints, maybe letting them know if they're unwilling to talk at that point, you know, being very strategic because a marriage is a partnership or a long-term committed relationship, it's a partnership. So how would you run a healthy business, right? Okay, you know, this is something that's really weighing on me. Like maybe we go to therapy about it. If you're unwilling to even have this conversation, you know, what are some other options? And then, you know, if the partner really can't fulfill it, then thinking about, okay, is this not the right person for me in my life? Mm -hmm. I always remind people that if you're feeling disconnected, if you're feeling a lack of intimacy, and if you're unhappy, your partner is too. It's a two-way street. So even if they're like, this isn't what I want, I'm totally happy where we are. Um, maybe they think they're content, but ultimately they're not because intimacy is a two-way thing. So if you don't feel intimate and connected, there's really no way your partner can. Um, and so maybe they're not desiring more intimacy, right? And if you are, it's, it's going to be a long 50 years. <laughs> so um, I hope that answers your question. Um, it's, so, it's so challenging, right? Because every single couple or, you know, um, person that comes in will have a different sort of upbringing. They have different like relationship experiences they're bringing to the table. They have a different way they operate. And so it's hard to like blanket it, but I think that's the best sort of advice is to be really open and vulnerable, create that safety, um, have patience, but mm -hmm. also give yourself a timeline Love so that. that you know really what you're doing. So let's take a couple steps back because I'm going to take you yeah. now down like a different crossroad. Okay. So we just talked about how probably half the world is practicing non-monogamy, right? Because we know mm -hmm. that 50% of humans are cheating. They're just choosing yeah. not to do it ethically. And we've talked about what to do and how to maybe broach the subject to your partner, like get confident in having a conversation with your partner. And then we talked about how it could go badly, right? What if we have this conversation with our partners and we're like, 
I don't know if you like come clean, like, Hey, I've been cheating on you, but like you come to your partner and you're like, you know what? I'd really like to open up this relationship. I'm curious. You know, I want to know what it's like to be with other people, blah, 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 blah. And your partner is like, okay, I can be curious about that. What would that look like? Let me lead Mm. you down that trail and give us some thoughts on what are next steps to that conversation when you do get them to a point where they're open and willing to try what open could look like? How do you crack that door open? Yes. And so what does that the, look like? Yeah, this is the fun stuff. Um, it's also a delicate space, I think, because there's like, so non monogamy has been so underground, right? So taboo that people hear you want to open your relationship. And it's like the images that come in are just like orgies, totally. like sex dungeons. Every night. Right? Right. It is so not that. Um, And I think a lot of people, too, will make the mistake of like diving right into something like that. Okay, great. We're going to sign up for, you know, lifestyle lounge and start going to their parties. Um, I think a great place to start is to really have a lot of conversations Um, like ad nauseum. I talk to people all the time. We're like, we've only talked about it for the last two years. We haven't acted on it. But I think that's such a healthy place. One, you're getting to know each other's wants, needs, and desires. Um, And two, you're like also probably getting excited about these possibilities. Um, It'll lend to creating agreements, right? Or like finding out what the boundaries are before you actually step into it. And then you don't have to like find somebody and like go on another date right away and like go have sex and then un- unravel that at home. Um, you could go to a bar together, um, you know, go to a dinner, right, with your your partner and then maybe like go to a jazz club. And the intention for tonight is just, I want to watch you um, go talk to other women and flirt, right? And so I'm going to sit back and see how that makes me feel um, or vice versa. You know, um, or we're, we're both good. We're going to go out and we're just going to pretend we're friends, right? We're going to go to this like cool new thing. Like maybe it's um, a cocktail hour or something where we don't know people um, or, you know, a, a, a park event. Like we're in L.A. so we're outside all the time. There's all these cool like pop-up retreats, like a yoga thing. Like that's where I'm going to go talk to somebody because, you know, I'm a yogi. And we'll go together and we'll kind of see how it makes us feel. Or we'll go to these places separately and then we'll report back. I kind of flirted with this guy. We made out a little bit. And just see how each other handles that information. That's a lot of information on its own, right? Um, Text flirting could be another. You know, um, the interesting thing is for Pasha and I, we had no trouble with these things because I don't know, we're kinky in the same way, but we both really get turned on hearing about the other one with other people, seeing the other person with other people. So I like to think we were really lucky in that way, um, that we didn't have a lot of a guard around that. I was like, can I be there? Like, is she comfortable with maybe like sending me a photo? (laughs) Like, I would like want to, you know, be there. And so lucky for us that worked and we met a lot of amazing people that did want to be with both of us. And so we had that, but like baby steps. And then every time you do something, coming back and talking about it and really going through it somatically. Okay. Where, how, where, why was that uncomfortable? Where did that feel like, like, where did that live in my body? Right. Doing the somatic work, um, which is new to a lot of people or taking it into therapy, right. Having a sex positive, um, you know, I think like create your relationship by design positive therapist can also help navigate this or a relationship coach. Um, But none of that's really necessary if you have a clear picture that we don't have to dive in and start sleeping with other people. Um, But once you're feeling like you have your bearings and the ground underneath you is solid, then yeah, start, start doing those things. And I think be, be open to knowing that as partners, you might not want to relate to other people in the same way, and that's totally normal. Um, in the earlier stages of our relationship, I needed much more of a relationship to have something outside of my marriage, whereas pa- Pasha was way more ca- like casual. He was really 
open and, and just easy to do such, sort of a casual thing, but didn't want to have a lot of responsibility um, outside of our marriage. Whereas I needed like consistency. I needed to feel safe. I needed to feel this element of like, we have a real connection mm-hmm. and now it's not that way at all. And it's almost like opposite. We've almost flipped. Um, and so I think just knowing that every single relationship will look differently And as you're trying out open, it will never look the the way mine does. And to take the baby steps and to be curious, like not having this idea of this is what I want it to look like, but letting it, you know, you kind of be on that journey. Actually, we created a quiz. Um, We created an open late relationship quiz that we are releasing. So I'll, I'll give you the link to it so everybody listening can go and download it and it's free and it's actually just like 15 questions to help you sort of figure out what relationship style would be most fulfilling to you which would suit you best so if you're like i kind of want to be open but like not all the time like maybe it's just hot vacation sex when like i'm on a girl's trip like that's more monogamous right and that's not polyamory so i think it can help people not feel as like intimidated or as scared as they're taking the baby steps into what hopefully will be like a beautiful lifelong relationship with maybe your partner and others, or maybe it's sometimes, or maybe all the time and you just never know. So we'll get you that quiz. Oh my gosh. I can't wait to post it. I also can't wait to take it. And I am coaching someone right now that's been in a 20 year relationship with his wife. Neither have ever had sex with anyone outside of their marriage. So like they went from like high school to being together forever. And at 20 wow. years, he's like, what the fuck have I created? Like, I'm not happy with my life. I'm not happy with my sex life. I'm not happy with my wife. I'm not happy with my kid. Like, I don't like what I've created. And it's come to this conclusion that he wants to start opening up his relationship. So he's having these conscious conversations. This quiz will be perfect for him and his wife because she'll be able to go like, I think more like what you said, like I want it to just be occasional. And he's like, can we just do something every night? <laughs> it'll be fun to see which one, which one they choose. And, and I think it'll be great yeah. topics of conversation from there. Yeah, I think so too. Uh, that's the goal, right? I think with both of us, like we both have these like awesome shows and it's really just to give people a different perspective more information about sex, right? Because it's so coveted and taboo yeah. and usually misinformation. Um, but just to normalize these conversations so that people can be happier, right? Yes. And more fulfilled. Yes. Um, yeah, so. Oh my God. That feels like a great place to end this too. Thank you so much for being on. Thank you for You're being so a shiny awesome. light and a beacon and not being afraid to talk about these somewhat difficult, hard, awkward, because it's just weird in our culture to talk about things, Mm -hmm. but thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Listening to Alexa's podcast as well. Like I'm like, Oh my God, there's more people like me out here talking about this. When, when I first started looking into polyamory three, three, even just three or four years ago, I couldn't find any podcasts that were recent. Everything was like Mm -hmm. a three episode show and people would just stop or it was right. old and outdated, or it was just mm-hmm. way too much for swingers. And I was like, where are the people that are normal that are open? And so like, right. we're, we're coming out, we're opening up, we're, we're coming out and we're talking about it. Yes. I love it. We're yeah. creating, we're creating our own community and it's growing and it's beautiful. Um, one more thing that I'll offer and I'll share this link with you, but we just created um, a WhatsApp thread. And it's essentially like there's a little screening process so that we make sure that we're collecting like really great people and, you know, no one who's against this to spam us. Um, But it's essentially just a way for people to connect all over the world and to ask questions and to just like get more advice because I found that I was answering a lot of the same questions all day long in my DMs. And I'm like, how can I centralize this? And so other people could also see this conversation and learn from it. Um, so we now have like an open uh, late thread that we jam on and it's brand new. And um, I would love for anyone listening who's searching for this community um, that, you know, Jen has created so beautifully too, um, pop in if you're if you're feeling like it. Love it. Okay. So we'll put all this juicy stuff in the show notes below. You guys, please go follow open late the podcast. It's amazing. 
And it's one of those that will like lead you to other podcasts and other people within Jessica's community and our community that have amazing content just like this. So thank you. Thank you again for being on the show. We'll talk to you later. Bye. Bye.